To share with you the two main points that's on my mind before I even get started and the reason is is because up till Monday I had two completely different thoughts uh, or passages of scripture to share with you guys I wasn't sure which one I was going to be looking at I had not resolved which one was was important for us this week and then Monday night I come in and uh, listen to brother Larry Wheeler preach and while he was preaching God settled the matter um, as I was listening and to cover both the, the difficulty with that is I had so many different places to go in Scripture, I don't know how to narrow it down. Lord willing, we'll, we'll look at these two main points and I'll leave out the rest and, and I'll point out areas where you need to go and study because God's Word is so rich in a couple of these places. There's one verse alone that I want to look at. We could spend the rest of the night looking at that verse. But the two points, there's two things that I want to get across to us tonight. The first thing is to understand what it means to be in God's army. The second point that I want to get across tonight is that as a soldier in God's army, He has equipped us with a battle plan. So I want to look at those two points. What it means to be in God's army and what the battle plan is that He's equipped us with for whatever fight that we might, might encounter. We're going to look in the starting out in the book of John, John chapter 14. If you'll take the time to turn there, there's a couple of verses that I want you to, to look at very closely with me. In the book of John chapter 14, I'm going to read two verses first, verse 10 and 11. But before I begin to read God's Word, if you'll join me in just one more moment of prayer. Father God, I thank You for Your Spirit that comes and dwells among us. The way that You manifest Your Spirit to us, we might feel Your presence with us. And Father, when we feel Your presence, we can rest and trust in Your hand that's guiding and, and working and meeting us where we're at and drawing us closer into Your heart, into Your will, Father. So I pray as we meet together tonight, as we look at these passages of Scriptures, that Your Spirit who speaks to us and as a result of looking into Your Word, gazing upon Your face tonight, Father, understanding who we are as Your soldiers, that we would, be, we would be encouraged, we would be strengthened, and we would leave here with a heart changed and ready and prepared to do what You've called us to do. Father, we praise You and give thanks to You for these things. In Jesus' name, Amen. John chapter 14, verse 10 and 11. Jesus is speaking here and He says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in Me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of Myself, but the Father that dwelleth in Me, He doeth the works. Believe Me that I am in the Father and the Father in Me, or else believe Me for the very works' sake. So it's a great mystery for us to begin to think about God and this, this um, triune nature of God. We have God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that the three of them are one. We don't serve three separate gods. We recognize that. Yet we see God all throughout the pages of Scripture. We see Him at moments as God the Father, leading and guiding His people with a perfect plan in place. We see Him as God the Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, who rose again, who sits at the right hand of the Father, and we see Him throughout the pages as God the Holy Spirit who comforts us, who dwells with us, is inside of us, who leads us into all truth. We see this one God in this mystery of the triune nature of God dwelling together, that one God in perfect communion, in perfect harmony, in perfect balance, with perfect love. Our minds can't begin to comprehend the true nature of God here. But it gets even better. Go with me. Stay in that same chapter. 
I'm just going to read one verse, and this is the verse I want you to go and you take and meditate and read on more, because we could spend the rest of our night just dwelling on, on the truth that's contained in verse 20. But look at me with verse 20 here. It says, At that day you shall know that I, Jesus speaking of Himself, I am in my Father. And listen to these next two here. And you in me, and I in you. I don't know if you get that, but what God is doing there is He's inviting us into that communion that exists with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's, a, he's saying that we are in Christ. Now, there's a couple of things we need to look at. There's some, some, some things we've got to clear up before we even look at that any further. There's a fundamental truth that we need to look at here. Why, why is Christ saying here that, that um, I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you? Well, the fundamental reason, the reason that we can say that practically and we can rest in that is because of what Christ has already done for us. What Christ had been, what well, the purpose of Christ had been from before the foundation of the world. You and I are in Christ because of what Christ did whenever He was born in this world and established truth, willingly submitted Himself to death on the cross, rose from the grave, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. That finished work of Jesus Christ. All of that, because of what Christ has done, we are able to be in Christ. The song that we sang a few moments ago, uh, no, we didn't sing, the three ladies sang, the four ladies sang, they boast, not in their own works, but I boast in the death and resurrection of Christ. We can have our boast, not pride, we can take joy and peace in knowing that we are in Christ. We have the privilege of being in Christ because of what Christ has done for us. What does it mean to be in the army of God? Well, I believe every one of us in this room today, from the least to the greatest, we are in the army of God. We are in that army because of what Christ has done. Jesus says, I am in the Father. <clears throat> Well, here we go. Verse 20. That I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. We can all say that fundamental truth because of what Christ has done. So what does it mean to be in the army? It means that we are in the army because of what Christ has done. But it doesn't stop there. Alright? There's more to that story. Because you can be in the army of God and not be a soldier of Jesus Christ. And that's the part that I want us to begin to focus on. We, we look at this fundamental truth and we can't disregard that. If I were to move on without saying we are in the army of God because of what Christ has done, I would be, I would be denying the sufficiency of Christ. But because of what Christ has done, we are in the army of God and now we must be soldiers. We're called to be soldiers. <clears throat> we're going to see that in the next chapter. What I want us to look at. I want, I want us... I was thinking about it just a moment ago. We spent time yesterday in Bible study looking at um, the battles that have already been won. And then we spent time today looking at the preparation for the battles that we're going to talk about tomorrow by putting on the whole armor of God. And then tomorrow we're going to look at some of the battles, the literal battles that you and I face. But if we're not a soldier, there's no battle for us. If we're not a soldier of Christ... We don't know how to begin to fight the battle. We'll never win the battle, that's for sure. So being in the army of God is because of what Christ has done. But just because you're in the army does not mean that you're a soldier. Sticking with this, being in Christ, the fact that we can be in Him and He in us, jump with me over to chapter 15. Just move one, one chapter over. I'm going to read a couple of verses. I'm going to read a whole passage here. The passage is important for us to look at because if you don't see the whole passage... We'll miss the, the important point. So I'm going to start at verse 1. And I want you to pay attention to that every time that the Word of God here, that Jesus Himself uses the word in or abide in, the phrase abide in. Alright? So pay attention to that as we look at this. John chapter 15 verse 1 begins, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch, and I'm going to take a little bit of liberty there, I want you to think of the word branch as being a soldier. Every soldier, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, it, 
that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If we're not abiding, we can do nothing. Without Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. Verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are born, burned. Verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. I'm going to read another verse in a second, but I want to take the time to pause there for a second and look at what Christ is saying in this passage to us so far. Now He's talking to a specific group of people here, but He's talking to you and I tonight as well. We are the branch. We are in the army of God. But we're called to be soldiers in this army. That's what we're studying this week. And a soldier is a soldier of Jesus Christ if we abide in Jesus Christ. Now that's kind of a confusing phrase. What does it mean to abide in Christ? What, what, what do we do with that practically? Look at another verse. Because he goes on and tells us. Just jump down to... Let's see what all I want to read here. I want to read... Let's pick up in verse 9. John chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. What the soldier must do if we're going to abide in Christ, abide in His love. What did that verse tell us we must do if we're going to abide? We're going to keep the commandments. He says it very clearly. He says, if... That word if is a conditional word. If you don't do this, you're not going to be a soldier of Christ. If you do this, you're going to be abiding in Jesus Christ. And a man of God who is abiding in Christ is that branch. He is that soldier of Jesus Christ. And what it says is, if ye keep my commandments. What happens to those children who are not soldiers of Christ? Who are not abiding in Christ? Who are not keeping His commandments? This is talking to each of us. Listen to this word of warning. Because what it says is, back up in verse 7, if, well, if, verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast, cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they're burned. A man of God who's not being a soldier of Jesus Christ is not worth anything. We can boast that we're in the army of God because of what Christ has done, but Christ is turning around here and saying to us, look, I've called you into my army. I've brought you into my army. And yet you're not keeping my commandments and being a soldier of Christ. You're worth nothing more than to be gathered up and to cast out and to be burned. And we know fundamentally what Christ does with that. He's not casting us into eternal heaven. But that's what you're worth as a child of God who's not being a true soldier of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be in the army of God? It means that we get to abide in Christ and keep the commandments of God as we serve as that soldier of Jesus Christ. I want you to hold on to that because as a soldier, we take that word now and we can look at that particular word, what it means to be a soldier. A soldier is not someone who's called to sit around on the pews all day long. A soldier is someone who's called that every walk, throughout every day, everything that you do, you're evaluating, you're aware, you know what is a battle and what's not a battle, and you are prepared to fight the battle. <clears throat> if we were to go and look at the, the example of our, the, the armies or the military of the United States of America, we have a U.S. Marine here with us tonight, or an uh, ex-U.S. Marine here with us somewhere, and um, he was trained, he was equipped, and he went into battle. Now when he went into that battle, he wasn't just sent out there and said, okay, Soldier, go find something to do. You have a gun now, go use it. That's not what that soldier was trained to do, nor is it us. God has a specific purpose and a battle plan for you and I to begin to fight. And I want you to consider that. 
We get to rejoice in, in being in Christ and abiding in Him. But as we rejoice, we must be a good soldier of God and begin to fight the battles that are in front of us. But Christ, but God in His great mercy and His love toward us, He equipped us that we might fight those battles with a specific battle plan. Now, with God's Word, I want to point out to you here for a second, there's no battle that you will ever fight that God's Word doesn't equip you with how to fight that. He gives you a battle plan. Some, if we were going back to the U.S. Marine example, if he were to go into a battle in the desert, well, there's one type of strategy that he needs to use. If he were going to a battle in the swamp, well, there's a whole different strategy that he's going to need to use to be able to fight that battle. If he were going into an urban area in the cities, there's a whole different type of strategy that he's going to need to use so that he's not taking out women and children or, or, or doing things that um, are not pleasing to his commander. There's a whole different set of strategies that he's going to need to use. And that's the same for you and I. I may face battles that you never face. God's Word has equipped me, if I go to His Word, in order to fight those battles. God's Word has equipped you, if you go to His Word, no matter what battle you face, so that you might be effective in that battle. So there's a battle plan. And there's no way that we can take the time to cover all the battle plans because we face all kind of uncertainties, all kind of trials and frustrations and, and battles in this life. It requires you abiding in Christ, knowing what the commandments of God are. It requires you being in God's Word to know what those battle plans are. I've tried to think about what your battles might be. And I wanted to speak to each of you. I made a list earlier of some different things. And I was thinking about, about each of you. Think about the primaries. We have several in here. Some of them are already passed out. But what's the, prim, what's, the, the, what's the main battle of these primary kids? We've had kids who are the age of primary. And I think that one of the primary things, that I, one of the main things that I would think of with the primary aged kids is that their main battle is learning to obey. As children, they see something shiny as an infant and they want to put it in their mouth. Mom and Dad says, don't do that, it's bad for you. And as they grow up and they begin to explore this world, explore everything around them, they want to explore it all. You know, um, and I, I can't remember his name at the moment, um, but somebody's son out there, the snake almost fell on earlier today, man, he was all into that. I think he would have climbed the tree if he had been allowed. He's interested in exploring what's going on around him, but his mom and dad says no. He has to learn to obey and that's one of his biggest battles, one of our, the biggest battles of the primary kids. I was thinking about the juniors. I was watching them this week, thinking about this particular thing. And I think one of the battles that I've seen them fight this week, or have to fight on that, on that level of age, is not putting themselves first, but putting others first. They're not necessarily selfish. Their, their motives are not selfishly motivated, but they don't think of others first. But they're at that age where they're having to begin to think of others first. And we say things to them like, okay, I've already let you answer a couple of times. It's time for somebody else. And they get disappointed in that, but they've got to learn to begin to share. There's a battle within them to put others first. And that's no simple task. We deal with that the rest of our lives. I was thinking about the intermediates. I was watching them today. I think you intermediates, one of the things that I watch today is the battle of, of whether or not you fit in. Do you match what some of your peers look like? Do you match and have some of the same interests and talents that some of your peers have. The battle that you fight about fitting in with your peers. I was looking at some of you seniors. I have no clue what you fight. It was hard for me to come up. So I had to ask my wife. And we were talking about it, and, and I had a couple things on my heart, and this is the word that we, we settled on. You fight a battle with rebellion. And I don't mean rebellion in that you're, you're wanting and desiring to go out and do just absolutely anything that you know is contrary to God's Word, but you're in an age in life where God has brought you to the ability to be a young man or a young woman of God. You have the ability to a large degree to be independent, to think independently, to do what you want to do. Yet you have to learn to have self-control with those things because you're not quite yet there. You have to learn how to temper those things down. God's Word, the world today gives teenagers an out. We call it the period of adolescence. <clears throat> oh, the teenagers are teenagers. They have the opportunity to sow their wild oats. 
the concept of sowing your wild oats, the concept of adolescence itself is not in God's Word. But yet there's so many things given, I think, teenagers today, the seniors, the opportunity to and the, the permission to. And so you have to fight that battle against that opportunity of rebellion against what you know is right. Being able to exercise that self-control. You can tell me if I'm wrong later, but I remember whenever I was a teenager, the opportunity was there on many occasions to do what I wanted to do. And I think I would have done a good job at it. My parents had taught me. They never they didn't even know I was thinking about those things, but they had already taught me some of the, the things that were right and wrong. And I had to fight against that will to do what I wanted to do. That rebellion that existed there. Now, we do have adults in the audience too, and so I was thinking about us as adults. What the battles are that we fight. Because the battle doesn't stop at any particular age. I don't know if Sister Moina is the oldest one here tonight, but if we were to ask her, does she continue to still fight battles at the age of 93, she would be able to come up and sit down and begin to tell us the testimonies of the different struggles and battles that she fights even at that age. We are soldiers forever this side of heaven. And I think, adults, as I speak to you guys about this, the battle that, that I want to summarize and say that we fight here, that I want to begin to look at a particular battle plan for all of us over these things, is that we fight against the world. There's a lot of worldly influences, a lot of cultural influences, a lot of ways of the world that we must continually fight against them entering into our lives, our homes, our families. And if we're not careful, we open the door through one small thing for Satan to step in and his goal is to destroy. We have to fight the battle to, to keep out the ways of the world. Now those are summaries, but those are battles that all of us fight. And I hope that you relate to some of those battles because what I, I have next is a, a, what I want to look at next in God's Word is a battle plan that He has given us. <clears throat> now, I couldn't settle on what here. So I'm going to give you two passages of Scripture. I'll, 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 <clears throat> I'll tell you which one I want you to go out and study more because there's so much to it. But if you'll look in Exodus chapter 14, there's only one, one small verse that I want to look at in this particular passage of Scripture. But I want to remind you about what's going on here. All of us remember the Hebrew children who were in captivity, who were slaves in Egypt. And Moses comes. God sends Moses to deliver the people out of Egypt, to lead them out of that captivity and that slavery. All the plagues have happened. Pharaoh's son died. Pharaoh releases them to go. They're now in the wilderness. And they're about to face a great battle. They are afraid of what they're about to face. And this is one of the battle plans that I want you to keep in mind every day. This is the first battle plan that we must look at. Because if we don't understand this battle plan, we won't be able to get, the, get through the next one. We won't be able to apply any of the rest of God's strategies in His Word. It's a very simple verse. It's Exodus chapter 14, verse 14. I'm going to read the verse phrase only. God's talking to them. He says, the, or, um, most talking to them, The Lord shall fight for you. Isn't that a beautiful truth? Now as I think about these battles, that begins to release for me some of that pressure, some of that struggle that I feel because I know whenever I face certain things, I am definitely afraid. I feel unequipped, underprepared. I have no clue what to do. Some of the most helpless, helpless times in my life I've ever experienced is when my children were sick. Nothing that I could do to fix them, to make them well, to do, to do anything better for them. And then I have this passage here to hold on to as part of that battle plan. The Lord shall fight for you. Don't ever forget that whenever you're facing a battle, if you are being a good soldier of Christ, if you are abiding in Him, God is fighting for you. And that's a beautiful truth. Don't let go of that. But that's not what I want to focus on. Flip with me in the book of Jeremiah. This is what I want to take a little bit of time to look at. And this is a passage where you like to go. I encourage you to go and take because there's so much here. This was the original thought that I had to speak on tonight and, and just expound on all these different things. We're going to summarize them two different ways. Let me tell you who Jeremiah is. Jeremiah is a prophet of God 
through the prophets, through three different kings. But what's happened during this period of time is that 12, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel have already been scattered. They've been taken captive by the Assyrian army. We're going to see the Babylonian army come in and take them captive as well. And they're going to spend time in, in that kind of captivity. God sends Jeremiah as a prophet to send warning to... Let me summarize this. But God sends Jeremiah as a prophet to tell them what the battle plan is. Look at, look at two verses with me. I want to look at verse 5. We just looked at it in Exodus 14, 14 where God says, The Lord shall fight for you. And we see this here in Jeremiah playing out. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. God's Word says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now that's just another way of saying the Lord shall fight for you. God had a specific plan and purpose for Jeremiah, and you see that playing out there. Now what was Jeremiah to do, supposed to do? Verse 10 is what I want us to focus on. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. God lays out six things there and that is our battle plan. We are called as soldiers of Christ to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. And truly, I'd like for you to go study that out. We're gonna, I want to categorize those two though. We, can't, we don't have time to go through every, all six of those in great detail, but as I look at those, there's two categories that's going on there. One, we see the time to fight. The battle plan to actually fight. And when we're fighting, what we're doing is we are rooting out, we're pulling down, we're destroying, and we're throwing down. Those four things, those four, first four things that um, God says to Jeremiah there. To root out. What are we rooting out? God is a God of truth. We're rooting out the lies and the deception that Satan has laid out there for us. And it starts from the foundations of, from the beginning of creation. Satan came to Eve and he spun a little bit of a lie on some of God's truth. And God's creation is sitting there in the Garden of Eden, perfect, hanging in the balance of what the decision of Eve and Adam would be with that lie that Satan laid out there. And they chose the lie. And today, you and I, because we are in that fallen condition, continue to believe the lies that Satan's laid out there. So we must root out the lies that are there. We must root those out, that deception that's there. Pulling down. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, they have to pull down idols. All throughout the Old Testament, we have to pull down idols. And we don't think about having to do that in today's culture. We don't have big statues of, um, of these gods that they had in the Old Testament outside on our, our, our grounds today. If we did, I, I believe we'd all go out there and pull it down. But we do have idols in our life that we must begin to pull down. An idol can be all kinds of things that we have in our life. It can be a specific degree, a career, a sport, a person, a TV show. It can be food. We have all kind of idols in our life that we have to begin to pull down. We have to destroy. There's one passage in the New Testament where um, God's talking. And He says this. He says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Well, that seems pretty extreme, doesn't it? Is your eye less sinful? Now what God is saying is we must destroy, we must radically amputate anything in our life that begins to harm us from being able to fight the battle that God's called us to fight. So if TV, for example, becomes one of those idols in your life, you need to destroy that TV. You radically amputate it out of your life. You do things that you need to do so that it does not deter yourself from being the good soldier of Christ that He's called us to be. We root out, we destroy, we pull down, we throw down. Now I want to take a moment to tell you what this throw down means. Uh, you guys could take it one way and throw it down. But what I want to, want to draw you to teach you, there's a passage of Scripture in the New Testament that says that our minds have this tendency 
to get vain in our imaginations. Our thoughts begin to exalt themselves against God even. And we're to take those thoughts captive and cast them down. We all of us must begin to evaluate even the very thoughts of our minds if we're going to be a good soldier of Christ. The battle plan here, the fight that we have is to root out, pull down, throw down, and destroy. But we don't always as soldiers fight. There's also, so we have a time to fight, but there's also a time to prepare. The majority of the time, we, Brother Wendell was the ex-U.S. Marine, we were asking him, did you spend more time in battle or more time in preparation? Uh, Brother John's a firefighter. Do you spend more time, Brother John, fighting fires or more time uh, learning how to fight fires, preparing for those fires, wherever he's at? You spend, they spend more time preparing. And that's what God's calling us. So when we begin to build and to plant, that's a time of preparation in your life. A time where we build on the foundation that God has already laid for us. The truth claims of God themselves. The truth of who Jesus Christ is. We build in the lives of those around us. We're not the only ones fighting the battle. We have our brethren to build in their lives as well. Share truth with them. And then we have to plant. We have to plant seeds of grace. Seeds of patience. Seeds of love. Seeds of respect. And as we prepare in those things, we will be prepared then to fight the battle. <clears throat> There's so much that I could say about that. Don't, don't turn to this passage. I just, in conclusion, I want to look at a particular verse. I want, to, I want to draw your attention to something. First of all, we are in God's army. And I want you to ask yourself, so are you being a good soldier in God's army? Second of all, do you know some of the battles that you're experiencing and that you face or might be facing soon? Some of you, major life changes are about to happen. And, and are you aware of some of those battles? And are you searching out God's plan for what the battle plan is to fight those battles? Joshua in the Old Testament took over Moses' role. Brother Jeremy talked about Joshua some this morning. That's a pretty great and serious role that Joshua took. And God said to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of uh, and very courageous is what God said. Be strong and very courageous. And that's what I want to leave you with tonight. We're called to be good soldiers. We have the blessing of being in the army already because of what Christ has done. We're called to be good soldiers. In order to be that good soldier, we must abide and we must know what the battle plan is for the battles that we face. And in those battles, and as we prepare them for those battles, we can be strong and very courageous because it's the Lord who's fighting with us. 